preach it. Just look for a Bible. I was going to let you preach if you just come on up here. And... I'll, I'll let you have that. Oh, that's all right. Come on. <laughs> Once again, y'all bless me with the invitation to come and share with you my faith. And to, uh, I'm curious, there's all kinds of stuff going on around here. Wow. And uh, to allow me to uh, preach. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what I want to accomplish this morning. And you'll tell me afterwards whether I did or not. I want to encourage you. I want to empower you with courage. Put courage within you. To be and to do Everything that you have been born into Christ to be and to do. I think it's one thing, from my perspective, one thing to be a good member of the church. And we, I, I've known many good members of the Lord's church. But that's not the goal. For me, the goal is not for me to encourage you to be good members of the Lord's church. For me, my goal is to encourage you to be a good follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. And those two are not the same thing. Now, you can't be a good follower and disciple of Jesus Christ and be a bad member of the Lord's church. That's just not possible. But there's more to it than just being a good member of the Lord's church, showing up on time and being involved in the activities of the church and then living your life out in the world separate and distinct from what you do in this building. There's a lot of difference between that. And so I want to give a word of encouragement and at the same time, a word of warning. If you have your Bibles, and I'm all good members of the Lord's Church carries their Bibles, and and uh, you know they read them every once in a while. I'm, I'm picking at you now. First Thessalonians chapter five. I want us to read the good parts first, and then we'll read the bad parts. There's a good, and there is, there is encouragement, and there's warning. So we're gonna do the encouragement first, and then we'll do the warning. Verse one, now as to the times and ethics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Why? For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Paul says, I don't need to write to you about this. You know the times and ethics, and you know <coughs> that the day of the Lord is going to catch people unaware. You know that. So go to verse 4. But you, brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. That's, that's encouragement. You're, you're sons of light. You're sons of the day. You're not like the world out there living in darkness and, and, and the things they do in darkness and the things they do at night. You're not like those. Verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober. Having put on the brace 
breastplate, the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Be what Christ has called you to be and do what Christ has called you to do. Be people of light. Be people of the day. Be people who are sober and awake. I'm not talking about being woke. I'm talking about being awake. I don't want you to be woke. Good gracious, we don't need no more woke folks, do we? But be awake. Be people of light. And how are you going to be people of light? Well, John said it like this. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But walk in the light. Be sons of light. Walk in the light as he himself is in the light, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sin. Walk in in light, be sons of light. No, no, K-N-O-W, not N-O, K-N-O-W. Know whether you're walking in the light or you just assume you are. See, that's what good church members do sometimes. They assume they're walking in the light because they go to church. They assume they're walking in the light because they teach Sunday school to children on Sunday. And then they, they have a life out in the world that's different than the life they're living or supposed to live in the light. The things that give them true fulfillment. That's what we're talking about, having life. Life is that which truly fulfills the deepest longings of your heart. That's what life is. Do you agree with that? I don't see anybody smiling. Maybe some smiles would tell me. Do you agree with that? That which fulfills the deepest longings of your heart is what life is. Okay, what's your life about? Is, is the church just a segment, one hat that you have to wear in your life, but you have many hats that you have to wear? You got the hat of being a husband, you got a hat of being a wife, a mother, a father, a police officer, your career, uh, you, you, what you do in the civic organizations. You have all different kinds of life, hats to wear, and, and your life is consumed by all the activity that those hats demand. And, 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 and so you're trying to do the best you can, keeping everything in balance. And so you wear your hat of religion faithfully by being a good church member but your life is really not about Christ at all. What's giving you fulfillment in the world may or may not even have his name attached to it at all. Huh?
Nobody needs to tell you anything about times and epics because you know full well that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You know that. Have you been taught that the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night? Yes? Yes. Well, what do thieves do? What do thieves do? A police officer is here. I'm glad you're here. What do thieves do? Steal. They steal. They destroy your life. When your life is centered around a Harley Davidson and now it's stolen. I mean, you ride that thing on the weekends with your love of your life on the back. And, and boy, I mean, life can't get any better than riding up the trace on a Harley Davidson, right? Wrong. Thief comes and takes your Harley. Your world is crushed. Your life is damaged. What fulfills you now has been taken away. Where's Jesus in that Harley? If he's in it at all, where is he? A thief comes to steal. Now this is not saying that Jesus is a thief, but he's like a thief to those who don't know him because what's giving them the very fulfillment of their lives is now going to become crumbled junk. Paul became a Christian and he said everything that was important to him that gave him fulfillment in life was a pound of a pile of cow manure. You know that's true in Philippian letter, right? You know about that? Everything that gave him meaning in life, righteousness by the law, status, power, procedure, all of that, pile of, a pile of manure. Now, some manure is good for something, but not all manure is. He counted it as rubbish, something to be discarded and thrown away. When Jesus comes in the day of the Lord, everything that's important to you is either going to be fulfilled or destroyed like a thief. Do you understand what I just said? If you know that the Lord is coming as a thief in the night, but you're a son of the day, you're a child of the day, and, and, and you are sober and you're looking forward to and longing for the day that the Lord comes. You are, can't wait for the Lord to come because you know that when he comes, everything that's critically important to you that gives you meaning and purpose of life is fulfilled in the grandest possible way. True? But where you live, where do you walk every day? Do you walk seeking status, popularity, position, power, wealth, beauty? The world has all kinds of value systems out there that, that people long to have and pursue so they would have fulfillment and meaning in life. I promise you if you're a teenager on the uh, magazine, the Cover Girl magazine, if you're 19 years old and you're on the cover of, of uh, what is the name of it? Uh, it was, it was Cover Girl, wasn't it? Big old pretty girl. And now this woman was in her 50s and now she's on Cover Girl again. See that commercial yet? Well, I promise you when she's 80, she won't look like she does now. She'll be a, she'll be a wrinkled raisin. Because beauty is temporary. So is power. So is status. So is your career. How many of you long for retirement? 
then you get retired and you long you, you long for having something to do with your life everything in this sun everything under the sun did you know that Solomon said everything under the sun is vanity of vanities all is vanity and so when the Lord comes notice what he says the Lord will come as a thief in the night for those who sleep do their sleeping at night verse 7 and those who get drunk get drunk at night well not always they sometimes get drunk starting in the morning God has not destined us for wrath, but for the obtaining of salvation. Who is destined for wrath? Whose world is going to be brought under the extreme heat of God's wrath? Not you and I, who are children of the day, sons of light, walking in the light, having a life that has its f deepest meaning and fullment in becoming like Christ in every aspect of what that word means so that we give ourselves, we sacrifice ourselves. Everything that we have is from God and for God's purposes for the ministry to others. If you have wealth, God bless you. He blessed you for a purpose. What for? To get more and more? No, 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 no. To give it away. And the more you give it away, the more he gives you to give away. That's a principle in Scripture if you haven't heard it. But if you're not giving it away, if you're like the Dead Sea and the Nile River, I mean the, the, uh, the, uh, the Jordan is flowing into you, but there's nothing flowing out of you, then you become a dead cesspool of minerals. Good for nothing. What's your life about? Is it about this world? Keeping everything balanced so all the hats you have to wear are all the responsibilities of the hat. People look at you and say, uh, he's, a, he's, he's a good, is it Kwanian? He's a good Chamber of Commerce person. He, 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 he's a good baseball coach for these young people. I love baseball. I love softball more than I do southern baseball. I have a girl that was pretty good at it. Yeah, you know about softball, don't you? Yeah. And it's very fulfilling, too. It's fun. Don't forget the Lord in your softball. It reconnected. So, first thing. Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us the day of the Lord is coming. And for them, I believe it was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the world crumbled for the Jewish people and the Roman Empire began to crumble as well. And everything that the Romans thought was important became nothing. And everything that the Jews counted as important because they left God out of it and they made him a tradition rather than a person, that became meaningless and nothing to them. And we live in America. We live in America today. Greatest nation in the world. Huh? No. I can't think of a greater one, but it's not a great nation. It's forgetting God left and right. It's changing the moral fiber and fabric of these young people, especially when they go off to college and get indoctrinated with this new value system that is coming. It's not new. It's been going on since the 60s. And now it has become so prevalent that the whole society, at least 60% of them, are under this delusion that everybody's a racist. The moral fabric of this nation of ours is built on power. Raw 
human power. It's built on, on wealth. The rich get richer and everybody else gets poorer. It's built on Hollywood standard of beauty and excellence. It's built on everything except the fabric of the Judeo-Christian ethic. That is being challenged and washed away, not in every person in America, but in the people that have control and power, it is gone. And the day of the Lord for the United States of America is at the door. And if you have your value system and fulfillment based upon the ethic of American politics today, well, he's going to come as a thief in the night and take it all away and you'll be left with hell. Or you can become a son of the day, a son of light, someone who is sober, someone who is righteous by the blood of Christ because Christ died for us. This morning we had a, well, we had a mediocre Bible class. If you weren't here, it was really mediocre because you weren't here talking about how you know whether you're a child of the light or not. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give us a test. i got five minutes and then I'm going to be quiet. When was the last time you approached the throne of grace in prayer to God? In the last 24 hours, anybody? Good, good. How many of us in this room, in the last 24 hours, placed ourselves before the judgment throne of Christ so he could tell us, reveal to us, what we've done today, whether good or evil? How many of us have put ourselves in the position to ask Christ, Lord, how am I doing? How many of us have been trained to do that so that we can walk by faith every day of our life and know because God is revealing to us the good we've done and the evil we need to shun? How many of us have been trained to do that every day and are doing it every day? Now, whether you do it the way I defined it or not, that's what you have to do if you're going to be a son, a child of the day and of light. Because the light has to expose your weakness and your darkness so that you can expel it through repentance and growth in getting rid of the evil, the darkness in your life, so you become a greater light of the world. Isn't that what Jesus said we are? We are the light of the world. How much light is coming from you and how much darkness is keeping the light from shining? And how do you know if you're not putting yourself in a position to ask the Lord, reveal to me, manifest to me, expose to me, the good you want me to get better at and the evil you want me to expel. On a day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. Verse 12. Ah, come on now. Don't do that to me. But we request of you, brethren that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. Who's doing that? Here. We don't have elders, right? So who's in charge of you? That's a tough question, isn't it? 
Do you have a pastoral system where the pastor's in charge? No. So who's in charge of you? Who are you going to appreciate for the instruction they give you? And who's giving you the instruction? How many of you have a mentor in the body of Christ that you look up to and receive guidance and instruction from? Have you been trained that you are to have mentors in the body of Christ? And who are you mentoring? Who are you instructing? Who are you giving guidance to? Who are you further along the path than they are? And you're going to serve them and give your life to them so they can make progress in their life. Just like the one who's supposed to be mentoring you is encouraging you and building you up so that you can make progress in the light as well. How many of us have a deep, significant relationship with other people in the body of Christ where Christ is elevated and our lives is improved because of that relationship? How many people in the body of Christ do you know that has those kind of relationships in their life? The closest friend I have and the second closest friend I have are both members of the Lord's Church and they help me tremendously. One of them is a preacher of an anti-church. The other one is Darren Hunt. Darren Hunt is the best friend I've got and every time we get together, man, we're at each other's throat over Scripture trying to understand it better. And I can sound off to Jim Allen, not Dr. Jim Allen, but Jim Allen, the preacher at uh, North Jackson Church of Christ where I attend. I can sound off anything to him and he will help me and he'll give me insight that I didn't have and he'll give me information that keeps me from going too far off in the deep end. You gotta have people like that in your life. You can't expect to get that with Sunday school faith, especially if you're not in Sunday school. Sunday school faith does not sustain life in this world. Do you believe it does? Do you believe that what you learned in Sunday school when you were a five, six, seven, eight, ten teenager, you believe that that Sunday school faith is what's making your life so enjoyable today? No, it's, it's been challenged in every simple, every way there is. And if you're honest, a lot of people have left the faith because Sunday school faith failed them. Should I have said that? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. But it's true. The kind of faith I'm talking about comes from iron sharpening iron where you're free to study and draw your own faith from your study of scripture and then bounce it off those that love you and find out if it makes real sense or have they experienced something different and helps you in other ways you got to have you cannot make it with Christ with just you and Jesus he did not set it up that way. The only way you're going to make it with Christ as Lord is that it is Christ as our Lord. It's us and Jesus, not me and Jesus. Now, I said I was going to quit in five minutes, but that was seven minutes ago. And I've been accused of being long-winded, and I'm not through. Y'all want me to stop or go ahead? Tell me what you want to do. Go ahead. Stop. I, I mean, I'm at a stopping place if we need to stop. Anybody hungry, so hungry that you're thinking about the restaurant rather than thinking about what we're talking about here? That's not nice, is it? Verse 13. Esteem them very highly. 
esteem others highly, especially if they're instructing you and guiding you and helping you. Esteem them. How do you, how do you, how do you know when you're esteemed? The way you're treated. We urge you, brethren, at, boy, I'll tell you what, this thing is just, I'm going to have to get me a different holder. My hand is just not good enough. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. You can't admonish the unruly if you don't have relationship with the unruly. They won't hear you if they don't know you love them. You've got to have relationships before you can correct people. Did you not know that? Try to correct somebody else's child and see how far you get. We urge you, brother, to admire. Now, this is how you know if you're a child of light. This is the kind of thing you do in your life in the world. Encourage the faint-hearted. Who's faint-hearted here? Who has, who has really a faint heart of faith that needs encouraging? Who is it? Who is it? Do, does anybody know who it is? Is there anybody here that would claim I need some help with encouragement and with my faith? Well, you can't know that if you're not in relationship. You can assume it. You can guess. But you don't know. Help the weak. Help the weak. Oh, relational. Be patient with everybody. Uh-oh. Well, that puts some people in the wrong boat. Right? See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Seek for that which is good for the lost as well as the saved. Rejoice always. You're in a bad circumstance. Life is tough. You're in pain. Emotional physical rejoice it could get worse but it's going to get better because there's a place prepared for you that's got no pain no sickness no death or dying pray without ceasing in everything give thanks give thanks for everything Ooh. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, you can't get much more explicit than that, right? You want to know what the will of God is? He just told us. That list of things is the will of God for you this week. This week, every night, stand before the, love, the Lord, the throne of grace in prayer, and the throne of judgment for correction. And see how you measure up against just this list here. You might want to in the future go find all the list of things that Paul says, this is what you need to be doing. And see how you're doing with that list. And go before the throne of grace and ask for strength and help and thanksgiving and rejoicing. And go before the throne of judgment and seek information, both reward and and discipline. And guess what? You'll be walking with the Lord in the light of his word. And he's faithful and just to cleanse you by his blood from all your sin. And when you agree with God that what you're doing is sin and you confess it, then he's faithful and just to, to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness and make you holy and <laughs> without blemish before him so that when this tent is folded up in its final resting place you are at home with the Lord now encourage one another verse 11 encourage one another and build up one another with these words just as you're doing. And I hope that the part that says just as you're doing is true. 
Well, the lesson is yours. I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. And I hope that it's meaningful and helpful. I'll, I do not intend to hurt anybody or upset anybody with my preaching. But we have to be forthright and candid with the truth. And so if I have hurt your feelings, I'm not going to ask you to forgive me. I'm going to ask you to straighten out your feelings. And if you don't know that I love you, then you don't know me. But I do. Let's pray. Father, help us. Strengthen us. Enable us. But more than anything else today, open our eyes to the reality you want us to see and want us to be and want us to do in becoming like your Son, our Savior, our Lord, our King, not just by claim, but because we have surrendered to Him. Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you need to respond to Christ this morning, not responding to me. If you need to respond to Christ in any way or any capacity that you have a need of, you come as we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is bread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Oh,